same as the ratio of the second to the fourth. Books eight and nine continue with Arithmos. Book eight investigates rational roots. Whilst book nine deals with odd and even numbers, primes and so on. But now let's get back to books five and six. The origin of these books is much later than that of book seven. Most of it is attributed to Eudoxus of Cnidus. Eudoxus flourished some 50 years before Euclid compiled the elements. He was a doctor, philosopher and astronomer who studied at Plato's Academy in Athens. Book five parallels much of what we found in book seven. Only instead of being confined to whole numbers, it deals with ratios of magnitudes, that is, of lengths and of areas. And many of the results in book seven appear here also, but in a different guise. For example, suppose we have these four magnitudes to compare. They must all be of the same kind, though, in this case, all lengths. Well, the proposition says that if AB is to AC as DE is to DF, then AB is to DE as AC is to DF. In book six, these ideas are extended to areas of geometrical figures. Now we come to the last four books. Book 10 is related to book 13, the last book. So let's look at books 11 and 12 next. Book 11 deals with solid three-dimensional geometry and it starts with 28 new definitions. For example, here's the definition of a pyramid as a solid figure contained by planes. And here, Euclid makes comparisons between the volumes of different shaped figures with straight edges. Book 12 extends this to the comparison of areas and volumes of curved figures, such as circles, cones and cylinders. Proposition 2 in this book is attributed to an earlier mathematician, Hippocrates of Chios. Hippocrates lived about 450 BC, and is said to have been the first mathematician to have written a work in the style of the elements. What Hippocrates said concerns the ratio of areas of two circles. He stated that the ratio of the areas of these circles equals the ratio of the areas of the squares on their diameters. The proof in the elements, however, is not due to Hippocrates, but to Eudoxus, and uses the method of reductio ad absurdum. It has the following form. We assume first that one ratio is less than the other, and then show that this leads to a contradiction. Then we assume the inequality the other way round, and show this leads to a contradiction also. Having thus exhausted these two possibilities, there's only one conclusion left the ratios must be equal. Now let's turn to the details of the proof. What sort of contradiction does this first inequality lead to? For convenience, we'll call the ratio of the areas of the squares k. So first, we're assuming the ratio of the areas of the circles is less than k. This is equivalent to saying that the ratio of the area of the large circle to the area of some polygon inscribed in the small circle is equal to k. Now we put to use the ability to construct regular polygons inscribed in circles. We construct a square inside this circle and then add isosceles triangles on each side so as to construct a regular octagon. Successively doubling the number of sides means that we can construct a regular polygon whose area is as close to the area of the circle as we please. In particular, 
we can construct a regular polygon in this circle whose area is greater than our first polygon. Now, in Proposition 1 of Book 12, it's been proved that the ratio of areas of similar polygons inscribed in two circles is equal to the ratio of the areas of the squares on their diameters. So we now construct in this larger circle a regular polygon similar to that in the small circle. By Proposition 1, the ratio of these two regular polygons must be k. So we now have two ratios, both equal to k. But the area A is greater than the area B. Yet the area C is less than the area D. And this is clearly impossible. So our original assumption must be wrong. The ratio of the areas of the circles cannot be less than the ratio of the areas of the squares on their diameters. A similar argument, first inscribing a polygon in the larger circle, shows that the ratio of the areas of the circles cannot be greater than the ratio of the squares either. Having exhausted these two possibilities, we're left with the only possible conclusion. The ratios must be equal. This remarkable type of proof enabled Eudoxus to prove similar theorems on the relationships of plane and solid figures with curved boundaries in the rest of Book 12. So we're left just with Books 10 and 13. These are thought to include the work of Theotetus, a young friend of Plato's. We know about him from Plato's dialogue of that name. Book 10 is a long and often difficult work. It deals with commensurable and incommensurable magnitudes, and it provides the groundwork for Book 13, in which Euclid introduces constructions for the so-called five platonic solids. But having said all this, no original manuscript of the elements has come down to us, or even a reliable copy of the original. No mathematical documents from this period of Greek culture survive. All that we have are copies made centuries later with changes introduced into them by the editors. In fact, we don't even know if the order of the books of the elements is Euclid's or that of a later editor. Let's look at some of the printed editions that appeared from the 15th century onwards and that are here in the Turner Collection in Kiel University. Here again is the first printed edition, the 1482 edition, and it's based on a manuscript by the 13th century cleric Campanus. Here's another edition, this time from 1505, in which Campanus's work is castigated, saying several wrong and absurd things proposed by Campanus have been arranged, divided up and corrected. And next, here's the 1509 edition by the Italian friar Luca Pacioli, in which Campanus is completely vindicated. He calls him the most faithful interpreter. And now we come back to the first English edition, the one by Henry Billingsley. It's got copious notes by the editor showing which parts are by Campanus and others. And when we turn over to the end of the book, we get a surprise. Because instead of 13 books, there are 16. Though the editor does indicate that the last three are by other authors than Euclid. And here's a rather nice edition. It's 19th century edition, 1847, by Byrne. And it's full of the most beautiful pictures. And in fact, some of the text itself is replaced by these coloured diagrams. But coming more up to date, here's what we regard as an authoritative English translation. It's in three volumes, and it's the one we've been using in the programme. It's by Thomas Heath, and it dates from 1908, and it begins with a long introduction. It's based on a Greek text which was reconstructed in the 19th century. But how did historians go about reconstructing a text 
which had been lost for centuries and existed only in late amended forms. Well, what were required were the earliest and most complete editions available. All but one of the 9th or 10th century editions derive from a text of Theon of Alexandria made in the 4th century AD. But Theon admits that he introduced changes and additions to the text. So these alterations have to be identified. This is just what the French classicist François Perrat was able to do in part at the beginning of the 19th century when he discovered a 10th century manuscript originating from the Vatican Library which he deduced was independent of Theon's text. In the late 19th century, the Danish classicist Johann Ludwig Heiberg took up this using Perrat's manuscript and a number of others. By careful comparison of the sources and by considering the reasons for the differences between them, Heiberg was able to produce what we now regard as the authoritative Greek text of Euclid's Elements. The Elements is a remarkable compendium of Greek mathematics, stretching from the semi-legendary Thales for a period of some three centuries. In it we encounter early Greek number theory, as well as the remarkable work of Eudoxus using proof by exhaustion, and also the work of many other mathematicians, amongst whom we've mentioned Pythagoras and his followers, Hippocrates and Theotetus. The collection and presentation of all this varied mathematical knowledge in a coherent logical form is one of the great intellectual and educational triumphs of ancient times.